This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 310 was recorded on February 10th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Hunte Investments founder and CIO Alex Garevich returns as this week's feature interview guest. Alex has a new book out chronicling his trading experience blow by blow through the pandemic crisis, and we'll be discussing that plus the usual suspects of inflation, the U.S. dollar, bond yield, stock prices in the face of central bank tightening, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our postgame segment when Patrick's chart deck is titled What's Next for the Markets? And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's get to that S&P 500. Market looked like it was everything was bullish and going, and then those CPI numbers came out, and uh, we find ourselves down uh, about 60 points at the time of recording around the 4,500 handle. Uh, what's your take on the S&P here? Well, I don't know. We haven't gotten to the postgame segment where you're going to tell us what's next for the market. <laughs> uh, what I see here is, you know, we're in between the 100-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. We got above the 100 just for, I don't know, eight hours or something. Uh, and we're back in that limbo zone. So I think on a technical basis, this is the the consolidation that comes after a big drop that we had after the Fed? Is it a dead cat bounce and we're headed to new lower lows below 4,200? Or are we just shaking off this inflation print we got this morning and headed back toward new all-time highs? Uh, I don't know, but I'm kind of leaning toward uh, the downside being the more likely case because I don't think the Fed can back out of their tightening plan yet, and they've probably got lots more tightening to come. But uh, let's talk more about it in the postgame segment. Sure. And so let's uh, move on to that U.S. dollar index, uh, which uh, has weakened a little bit here today, down about 20 points. But I mean, I think the big move was last week uh, after um, uh, the ECB. And so really, since then, the U.S. dollar has been backing off. Euro has been strengthening. But uh, that's not the case for all currencies. Even the U.S. dollar yen has been relatively strong. Is this just more chop for the dollar or do you think there's a decisive move coming? Well, the way I see this picture, Patrick, is we were consolidating and really just hugging right around that 96 handle on the dollar index. And then we got the Fed, and it was the great big roller coaster ride of up and then down and then up again. Guess what? Now that that's kind of shaking off, where are we? We're back down to consolidation right around 96 even on the Dixie until, of course, we got the inflation print. That was another knee jerk down this morning. But, uh, you know, I think we're basically consolidating in the same range. Let's definitely ask Alex Garevich. This is very much up his alley. So I'm going to use this time, since we've mentioned inflation a couple of times, uh, let's Let's talk a little bit more about that. We had uh, another record inflation print. The headline number was 7 spot 48%. Holy cow. Now, there's a growing consensus that I'm seeing in, in various different research notes and things you read on the web and so forth, different banks and so forth saying they think that inflation is probably going to peak in February. So I am assuming they're talking about the official February number, which doesn't come out till early March. That would mean in order to, to know that it's the peak, you'd have to get the next one, which would be the March number that doesn't come out until April. Uh, if they're right, and we do see starting in April uh, as we get that March number that things have turned around, well, maybe it's really true that myself and the several other guests who anticipated and correctly called for this inflation long before it started and who think it's a secular inflation, we're all wrong. And it really is just a matter of tightening supply chains and it's all going to get better. Uh, so, I think most of the institutional market is really positioned for that, the transitory inflation view. And I think you'll hear Alex Garevich pretty much agreeing with that view in today's interview. I'm the odd man out here. But boy, if it turns out that uh, this minority view that I have, which is <laughs> this is not transitory and that we are in a secular inflation that's only just getting started, well, that would suggest 
And as we get to April, May, June in that time frame, if the confirmation is coming in that all those folks that thought, well, February was going to be the peak, if it turns out that's not the peak, it just keeps on getting worse, that's when I think you would see a real sea change in markets as the big money says, wait a minute, this really is a secular inflation. So far, it's only you know crackpots like me who think that. Well, let's find out what the crackpot thinks of crude oil then. Okay, Patrick. Well, EIA inventory came in with a whopping 4.8 million barrel drawdown. Of course, we are coming into the season where that's expected. Cushing, Oklahoma drawing down 2.8 million barrels. Gasoline building 1.6 million barrels. Distillates drawing down 929,000 barrels. U.S. production ticking back up 100,000 barrels to 11.6 million barrels. Now, as we got that bullish print, it was an instantaneous rocket ship ride right up, I think more than a dollar of upside, to the five-day moving average, which then just retraced very quickly back down to where it started. And, uh, you know, the market, I think, was already way overbought on Russia, Ukraine, inventory, and so forth. But then, you know, after a couple days, sure enough, we, we, we got a little bit of a test of lower numbers all the way down to the almost down to the 13-day moving average on WTI and down to the eight-day moving average on RBOB gasoline. So where are we now? Very important, I think, whether or not we can close above the five-day moving average today. We're still speaking well before the close. It was looking great, a good dollar and a half above that five-day moving average. Surely it's going to close above it. Oopsie, just in the last half hour, we're seeing the market kind of take a nosedive. We're back below not just the five, but the eight-day moving average, all the way down at about 89 spot 60 after touching 91 spot 60 uh, something uh, just an hour ago. So it seems like the roller coaster is still upon us. I'm not sure where it's going to end, but if we close below five and eight day moving average, that's probably a sign that we're going to get below the 13 before this is over. If we close above those two short term moving averages, uh, then it would suggest that maybe the bottom is in for this correction. I'm kind of leaning towards the bottom's not in because it, it seems to me we were really, really overbought on all the Russia Ukraine stuff, inventory, everything else. If we're taking a pause and having a correction here, I think there's room for a deeper correction than the one we've had. If you just look at the magnitude of the big move up and how small this correction has been, we could have a much bigger correction than this, and it still would not disrupt the bullish trend, which I very much still think we're in the middle of. Now, I also want to point out, you know, a lot of people have said, boy, how far could it go? I mean, look, that $147 record print in 2008, that was an extraordinary event. That's probably not happening again. You know, wait a minute, time out. If we just inflation adjust that number of $147, which was the record high print on WTI crude oil back in 2008, well, that's at least $220 in today's dollars. So we'd have to get to $220 just to match the previous high. And I think we've got maybe the beginnings of a setup for exactly that to happen. Now, to be sure, if we got anywhere close to that, this would become extremely political. There would be all sorts of government efforts to get the prices down, you know, price controls, who knows what else, what other stupid ideas they might try. We're nowhere close to that, but I think there's plenty of scope for much more upside in 2022. At the same time, we are way overbought here. And if there's any de-escalation of the Russia-Ukraine situation or anything else, there's plenty of room for a much deeper correction before we resume the march higher. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to gold, which uh, gold a couple of weeks ago had that really nasty drop, a uh, drop from like 1850 to 1790, like uh, within days. And uh, was, it seemed like gold was ready to sell off all over again. But uh, here we have been for almost two weeks, a steady crawl higher, back above 1800, 1830, above moving averages, but no real exciting breakout. Is this uh, going to finally attempt a bull breakout here or is this just going to be more of the same? You know, it's hard to say, Patrick, but I'm kind of leaning toward more of the same for the simple reason that if I look at the chart, as you just said, it looks pretty good, but not extraordinarily good. We are above 1830, which was a, a key resistance level, but we were way above it a little while ago, earlier in the day. We're back down to 1836, so, you know, six bucks above it right now as we're speaking around 1.30 in the afternoon on Thursday. Um, what's the end of the day going to bring? Are we going to be back down below that 1830 level? Now, if we get above 18. 
1860, the high from before the Fed, and especially if we get above 1880, which was the high back in November. Well, that really tells me maybe we've got something to get excited about technically. Uh, the fact that we are uh, above 1830, as you say, is positive news. But how many times have we seen that signal before only for it to retrace? So I think we need to wait this out. All right. Well, let's touch on the 10-year treasury yield because last week uh, we highlighted in the post-game chart book uh, what was happening in the credit markets, but it certainly did not quit this week. And here we are at 2%, the the 200 basis point level on uh, the 10-year yield. Uh, Bonds are are really starting to get hammered on the downside. Uh, One, what's, uh, what's your take on what's going on? And two, when will the stock market start to care? Well, today's breakout through 2% on the 10-year yield was definitely a newsworthy event. But, you know, let's put this in context. This was definitely in reaction to that inflation print. And if you look at what happened to gold, say, you know, you had the, the hawkish Fed. All of a sudden, there's just this roller coaster ride where it's an absolute nosedive and then it recovers. We're not quite back up to pre-Fed, but we're getting there. So this move above 2% on the 10-year yield is a roller coaster ride that was induced by the inflation print. If you're really in that camp that says, okay, February has got to be where the peak is. This is almost over. Well, then probably the, the market will only spend a short while above 2% on the 10-year yield and then it'll start to retrace lower. But let's ask Alex Garavich this question, Patrick, because he's the man for fixed income, and I don't want to steal his thunder. Uh, I think it's very interesting, this view about inflation supposedly peaking in February. Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not that proves out. And if not, I think it's uh, maybe a sea change event. Let's find out what Alex thinks in the feature interview. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Hante Investment founder and CIO Alex Garavich. Eric, why did we invite Alex back on the show this week? Well, Patrick, as our longtime listeners, I'm sure, have noticed for the last several weeks, if not months, my 10-year commentary has been, this is a time in history to not take your die off the ball because it's very important to understand what's going on here, and frankly, it's above my pay grade. Now, the universally accepted in the finance industry norm thing to do in this situation is for me to make shit up to try to sound smart, even though I have absolutely no clue what's going to happen next. I like to diverge from that industry standard and try to seek out somebody who actually knows what the hell they're talking about. My favorite two guys in terms of really heavy duty fixed income guys that really get macro are probably Jim Bianco and Alex Garavich. Alex was the first that we could get lined up and that's why we've got him is because I don't know what's going on with uh, yields and where they're headed, fixed income in general. Uh, Is this really the beginning of the end for the bond market or is it just another one of Lacey Hunt's warnings that, hey, it's uh, the times when it looks like he's the most wrong is actually when he's being proven the most right. Well, Eric's interview with Alex is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Abex Technologies invites you to Smarter Markets' new podcast series, Demystifying Carbon Markets. Corporate climate pledges went mainstream in 2021. Moving into 2022, these companies are increasingly focused on developing and implementing plans to turn their climate pledges into climate action and understanding how carbon markets can help them turn their good intentions into meaningful change. For many, however, carbon markets remain unfamiliar, creating apprehension over potential risks. They have many questions. What are carbon markets? What types of projects help reduce carbon emissions? How do I judge the quality of these projects? Will the carbon markets be large enough to meet net zero goals? In this series, Smarter Markets teams up with Base Carbon Corporation to bring you the architects and practitioners of the carbon markets, seeking answers to all of these questions from people who know the markets best. Episodes are available weekly on Saturdays beginning February 5th. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Hante Investments founder and chief investment officer, Alex Garavich. 
Alex has a brand new book out, and no surprise, considering it's Alex, it shot straight up uh, right now at number six on the Wall Street Journal's bestseller list. So you're not going to want to miss this new book, which is called The Trades of March 2020, A Shield Against Uncertainty. We'll talk about the book a little bit later on in the interview, but Alex, it's great to have you back. It's been too long, as you know, because I, I know you listen to the show yourself frequently. I've been asking almost everybody to talk to me about inflation and its relationship to the bond market and interest rates. And as we're speaking this week, I don't know if we hit 2% yet, but I was looking at one spot 98 on the 10-year yield earlier this morning. So uh, if we're not already there, we're, we're getting awfully close. What's going on? Is the bond bull market over? Does this mean that we're seeing the beginning of secular inflation that's going to collapse the bond market? Or is this something completely different? Well, first of all, it is good to be back. I'm thankful to you for having me over at the podcast again. It's always fun and good conversation. Now, of course, it's this is the topic de jour, the dramatic shift in central bank policies that occurred over the last few months, which led to dramatic um, raising an expectation of short-term interest rates in most uh, developed market countries. It also, as you mentioned, even longer-dated yields are beginning to buckle a little bit, even though most of the curve trading was flattening, and I think that is very important to notice over the last few months. As for my view on the bond bull market, when we came out of 2020, I wrote a lot and thought about a lot about the enormous amount of money printing which was at that time combined with the Fed focusing on just U.S. central bank policy, combined with the Fed being very adamant about that they will wait, that they will let inflation run hot uh, in this post-COVID, post-pandemic transition period and see what happens. And that kind of created some concerns for me that the yield curve might be much steeper, that the yields could go higher, even though I was not necessarily thinking that that was going to happen, but I had a concern. If I would, I would say that this concern is alleviated. I'm no longer concerned about inflation and I'm no longer concerned about end of bond bull market because historical pattern, the pattern of how market is trading is telling me otherwise. Okay. Tell me more about uh, not you were concerned about secular inflation and now you're not and you're no longer concerned that the bond bull market might be ending. Those are two really big things. Give us a little bit more color and perspective on why not. Well, first of all, I, what, as I like to always say, when I think about inflation, I think of inflation as a layperson. I am not a, an economist who does analysis. Uh, and I cannot crunch numbers myself. I have to take somebody's numbers in. So it's a little bit of a back-of-the-envelope thinking. What my expertise is recognizing patterns in markets and seeing how markets trade. So I will start, actually, if you don't mind, with actually bond market itself. One of the things that I've recently said, every time the curve is flat, very flat, looks very flat, the curve is not flat enough. What it means that I recognize this pattern over decades. Whenever Fed starts raising rates and the forwards start getting flat to invert it, usually by the time what the market projects right now, the curve is getting flat in 2023, it's almost certain that there will be easing cycle in 2023. I feel right now I would assign probability of 70% that we will be easing in 2023. Maybe maybe it's a little bold, but definitely more than 50%. Because the curve already, usually the curve has this uncanny way of flattening right where the easing will come and never flattening enough. So that is my central view. That, And we can talk about a shift in the Fed, because to me that actually didn't make any sense, their shift in policy and stance, because I feel like inflation risks are much lower now than they were a year and a half ago. The reason why I think, and, and this I will get to that, but I just wanted to say, first of all, the market pattern, the way equities are trading, the way uh, currencies are trading, though currencies, there is a caveat there, if you wish we could discuss. The way bond markets are definitely trading shows us that we're probably closer to the end of the cycle and the easing cycle is not far away from us. And when it comes to inflation, to me, inflation risks are risks that did not materialize while other people think that they did materialize because what i see is a lot of front-loaded post-pandemic inflation which is just all predicated on the both fiscal and monetary expansion that happened in 2020 and it's no longer happening i see no reason for a spiraling effect and that they could be wrong because that there are definitely certain political and societal shifts that 
do cause some upward inflationary pressure, but I wonder if they will be completely offset by the negative fiscal and monetary impulse in the next couple of years. But I don't really see a spiral. The price gains and the wage gains will not be taken back. I'm pretty sure of that. But I don't think they, there's going to be any kind of pernicious spiral. Conversely, what I don't see is what would be, I don't see any kind of signs of fiat collapse. We do not have a problem with currency because we don't have a problem with excess liquidity anymore, interestingly, which we did in 2020. It took us that little time to actually end the problem of excess liquidity. How do we know that? Well, the disparity of commodity performances. We see industrial commodities doing really well on price and oil doing really well on price. Meanwhile, gold, silver, platinum are kind of meandering and cryptocurrency is meandering. So the hard assets, store of value assets are meandering. What it tells me is that the drive right now in inflation is not the excess liquidity, but the shortage of supply. And that is a that is a temporary problem rather than a rather than a spiraling problem. I would be very differently, maybe felt I would felt probably different if we'd see hard assets rallying really hard, really strongly, like store of value assets rallying hard. Alex, let's talk about the U.S. dollar next. Ever since so, I guess it was the middle of November, it seemed like the Dixie was kind of hitting pretty strong resistance around 97. Then we had the recent Fed announcement where we saw a spike that only lasted a couple of days with, a, a, I guess we call it a fake breakout above 97. Now we're back down almost to 95 as uh, we're speaking on Tuesday, a couple days before this will air. What's going on with the dollar? Also, a little earlier, you mentioned a caveat about currencies. What's the caveat? What's going on? Well, sometimes I use the dollar to judge where we're in the cycle. And sometimes you can, by thinking where you're in the cycle, you can uh, form your view on the dollar. So it could be like chicken and egg situation. I was a little befuddled by the dollar because in 2020, I, I saw I took a dollar negative view after pandemic. Money is printed. There will be a lot of cash. It will be good for emerging markets. In my opinion, it would be good for all carry trades. It would be good for precious metals. That's really not what materialized. For a while, it actually worked. But then in 2021, actually, all while stock market kept going up, carry trades were going down. That is, emerging markets, currencies, many of them were underperforming. A lot of other trades which are structured in a way to deliver carry, including like yield curve trades or whatever, they were all going sideways in 2021 when the central banks shifted their policy. And for about a year when precious metals stalled and uh, the dollar decline stalled, I was kind of, that's normal. That's like 2004. But then the texture really started to change and dollars started to get stronger and precious metals have started to meander even more than I thought they would, longer than I thought they would. It's already like a year and a half of meandering. That's a pretty long period. So I started to have doubts and I uh, switched some of my I switched to longer dollar stance in my portfolio, or at least my balance stance, and that worked better with respect to dollar over the last few months. I feel uh, you could be back to the thesis I put up in my first book, The Next Perfect Trade, where I really talked about this magic sort of necessity. If dollar, if US raises rates, that certain things have to happen, like dollar will have to outperform in the long run zero negative yielding currencies if it itself raises rates. There are a couple of caveats going on here. One of them is that the hawkish stance is unusually synchronized right now in the world. That you could, like the widening of interest rate differential between the US and Europe is not that obvious with European rates going higher dramatically too. There's been a big shift in European interest rate policies, right? So it's it's more of a synchronized thing than a dollar centric rate hikes. And the other thing that a little bit I'm puzzling about, usually actually dollar weakens during the tightening cycle and right now it's strengthening. And it could indicate it that could indicate that there is uh, it's kind of counterintuitive because you think when Fed over hikes, dollar's gonna strengthen, but Towards the end of hiking cycle, it often weakens, like in 2018. It actually weakened in the beginning of 2018. And in 2000, towards 2006, 2007, dollar was actually weakening. And I don't see that. I was expecting that kind of thing to happen, that maybe it's my timing, maybe what's happening right now, that dollar, like this is why I start doubting myself. 
maybe the dollar right now strengthens at the beginning of tightening cycle. The tightening cycle is going to go, dollar might weaken. And only when dollar weakens significantly, we will see the end of economic cycle in the U.S. It's kind of confusing to think through those things, I'll be honest. Let's bring the stock market into this discussion. Of course, after the uh, announcement of the tightening cycle, we saw a nosedive. The market spent, well, I guess it was about a week below the 200-day moving average. That's the first time that's happened uh, since the pandemic in March of 2020. And then we spent a few days getting back up to the 100-day, and now we're sort of in that you know, zombie land in between the 100 and the 200. Alex, you are definitely a uh, long-term big picture thinker, so I don't want to worry about moving averages. How do we interpret what's happening? Is this the beginning of a bear market because of the tightening cycle and we're headed down to 3,000 from here? Or is this temporary and headed back to all-time highs? It is always very, very difficult to be negative on the stock market, first of all, because stock market on average goes up. So if you don't know anything about the world and you have to make a Casino bet, will stock market will be up or down in two years. It's much more often up than down, so you should be betting that way. However, I would say honestly, I am probably as bearish as can one be on as I can be on the stock market. Pretty much as bearish as ever. As ever. And as ever, yes. There's pretty much no conditions I can imagine that would be more bearish for me for stock market. No, wait, wait, wait. Let me qualify this, Alex, because you just wrote a book about the trades of March 2020, where obviously there was a big plunge in the market. And you just said now you're more bearish now than you were then. Well, then I was actually bullish. Okay. Because I was buying, I was buying all stocks and assets in March 2020 as they were going down. I didn't buy everything at the best possible level, and I will go through some of the logic of that as it was unfolded in my book, as it unfolds for me now. I want to qualify that when I say I'm bearish, that just basically means that I'm flat. Because to me, being bearish stock market is just staying out of it and waiting it to fall so I can buy into it. I don't typically take short positions on stock market because of the thing that I mentioned before. The odds are so skewed against you when you try to bet against stock market that even when your bias is very bearish, it's probably not a super worthwhile proposition. But let me go through that and through my thinking. In my first book, the next perfect trade. And it's very important when it was written. I think I brought it up on Macro Voices before this connection, but I'll bring it up again because it's been insanely good. So the book was written in 2014, 2015. And back then I observed a certain pattern that happened to have persisted through the last seven years with incredible faithfulness. And the pattern is the following, that the change in 10-year yield over two years is a very good predictor of stock market performance over the following two years. So think about this. There's a time lag there. Ask a simple question. Has 10-year yield risen or fallen over the last two years? And you will know what stock market will do next two years. So let's go to 2013, 2014. That's when I was even starting to think about this. So all this observation was based on the previous pattern. But let's see what happened. Taper tantrum. Rates have risen in 2013, 2014. In 2015, 2016, we had a stock market correction and two years later, an industrial recession. What have rates done in 2015, 2016? They've fallen quite a bit with Brexit. Rates were very low in 2016. And for the following two years, we had a really strong stock market right after US election from 2016 to 2018. Now, what happened in 2018? Rates have risen considerably. There was a tightening cycle. And what happened from 2018 to 2020? First, there was choppy stock market in 2018, and then there was a COVID sell-off. How this predicted COVID, I have no idea. But exactly two, almost exactly two years from with this indicator of having of negative yield momentum on 10 years, stock market hit the lows in 2020, very close to that. What happened in 2020? What I saw in 2000, now we're going to the trades of March, right? My book. I'm in 2020. I have no idea what's going to happen to economy. I have no idea what's going to happen to pandemic. I mean, I have some ideas, but I'm not a doctor. And I don't know how to predict those things. I don't know what would be the government responses, the economic responses, what variants will be there. It's all complete uncertainties. And hence, I coined this term, a shield against uncertainty. What I did know at that point is that it's one way or another, the pandemic will pass. And one way or another, the central banks will add 
so much liquidity that it will become excessive. No matter how much drain on liquidity the pandemic will be, they will keep adding and adding liquidity till it will be too much of it. I knew those things for facts, and that informed all my trading through. And we can discuss some specific examples. So when I'm looking at 2020, the momentum, this interest rate momentum was extremely positive. The rates in 2020 were very much lower than the rates in 2018. So there was no question for me that this was a time to be limit long assets. It didn't really mean like all in stocks, but you had to be in every kind of asset that benefits from liquidity. And that's what I've done in 2020. What I might have not done perfectly well is in 2021, the, that momentum indicator was still positive, though not as positive in 2020. But I kind of started to reduce my beta positions probably earlier than I earlier than I had to, and I probably shifted not so much into stock market but into carry trades, which performed much worse on stock market. That might have been my mistake over 2021, but I was still following through on this idea. And right now, I'm seeing the momentum. As you mentioned, you just spoke about 10-year yield. Looking back to the beginning of our conversation, it is higher now than it was two years ago. And guess what? That indicator in the next several months will get more and more negative. So liquidity is liquidity momentum will be very negative. The yield momentum will be very negative for the following few months. And that bodes for us poor stock market performance or relatively poor stock market performance for the following two years. And I think other things are lining up as well for that, like the earnings momentum, everything is kind of iffy right now. Alex, I'm curious about something you said a minute ago. You said that after 2020, you were certain that the central banks around the world, particularly the Fed, would provide so much additional liquidity in the form of stimulus that it would be too much. Uh, I agree completely. That's been my view as well. But it, it feels to me like it's at odds with what you said earlier about inflation, that you're not concerned about it turning secular. So what am I missing here? Yes. Yeah, so the difference is they did probably provide a little too much liquidity by 2020. But what I did not expect them is to turn around so quickly and start taking away that liquidity so quickly. I was expecting, my thinking in 2020 was that they will actually let this too much liquidity slosh about for longer. And that's why I was concerned about inflation. What I was thinking about is that the recovery from pandemic will be very uneven. And there would be sections of population still hurting, and raising rates will appear to be uncompassionate. And the reality is that it is kind of weird for them to take away liquidity now, because if you really think about what is the biggest problem, the biggest problem right now is supply bottlenecks. How are you going to fix supply bottlenecks with raising rates? That's not going to make things cheaper. It's not going to get easier to get aluminum because you raised interest rates. If anything, it's going to get harder because it's harder for new production capacities to develop. So basically, because if you go back to what is actually the problem with inflation, what is wrong that we have inflation? Why is it a bad thing? Because we wanted wages to go up for a while. The problem is the immediate problem, the immediate political pressure is that people are complaining that it's getting more expensive to buy things, right? And then the Fed says, well, in order to help you to make it easier for you to buy things, we're actually going to take money away from you so you have even less money to buy things. Now I'm making it even harder on you to buy things. And now because it will be harder for you to buy things, you'll buy less things and prices will come down and eventually it will be easier for you to buy things. I think it's a very convoluted logic. It just makes no sense to me. So I think I was really surprised by that hawkish stance. And not that necessarily it's wrong. I just feel it's intellectually incredibly inconsistent with what they were saying a year ago. I feel like nothing changed, but they, under political pressure, they would. They very specifically said what they would do in a situation like now, and they're doing the opposite. And that makes no sense to me, but that's the world, and I have to adjust it, and I have to trade accordingly, because that's just the reality of the market. Alex, let's talk about gold, because it's a subject near and dear to our listeners' hearts. And, you know, i got to tell you, I've been listening to the gold bug narrative for 20 years, and it basically goes, look, what's going to happen eventually is the government is going to just, you know, borrow and spend and print too much money. They're going to debase the currency. We're going to get to significantly negative real yields, and the price of gold is going through the roof to the upside. The crazy thing, Alex, is I think every single one of those predictions has now come true, except for the prognosis on the price of gold. 
what's going on? Was it just a flawed analysis to start with? Or, or why don't we see the reaction in gold that so many people expected specifically when things that have already happened were going to happen? Well, first of all, I have a really good forward answer to you. I wish I knew. That's my that's my key phrase to answer. I am a little puzzled too. I was never a gold bug in the same sense. I never believed in the collapse. Well, it was a concern, but it was a minor concern for me, the collapse of fiat currency that like, oh, people would just stop, lose their faith in dollar. I never saw that coming. I didn't think that would come. And people will run into gold. To me, gold is just an indication of excess liquidity. And yes, I would probably expect gold to perform a little better in the liquidity storm of 2020. I think what turned out is that people just, instead of running to gold, ran to a whole bunch of other assets. They were buying real estate, cryptocurrencies, some weird uh, mem stocks, anything to put the dollars in. Like It was kind of like a dollar collapse as an asset happening, but gold was not a big beneficiary of it. And I was probably expecting it to do, it did well in 2020, but I was expecting it to do even better. Going forward, I started to have my doubts eventually. I was pretty steady on course on gold. I was like, yeah, it's a cycle and it doesn't matter even whether the Fed tightens or not, it doesn't actually matter. Gold ran really strongly through the whole tightening cycle from 2002 to 2007. And honestly, I still think that might happen. There is a very good chance of that happening. But I don't have an overwhelming conviction in it right now because it just the pattern seems to be different. Maybe we're in a different world and there's just too many other stores of value. Maybe because in the end, when people say gold should be higher, like when people start complaining gold prices are manipulated lower, that sounds like nonsense, to be honest. Where gold should be, there is no shoot for gold, right? Because the industrial Demand for gold is pretty low relative to above ground supply. It's, it's all about like people deciding to buy or sell gold for whatever reasons they decide more buyers than sellers and it goes up. And I just really don't understand the full dynamics of it. To me, precious metals were just the bet on precious metals was about good risk reward. Because if you think like silver is a good example to silver trading like $22, $23. Can it go down from here? Of course, it's been as low as like 11 or $12, I think, in, in the crisis of 2020. But can it go to $50? I think very easily. So the risk reward is very good. But this is kind of a situation that you cannot say, I'm going to win on this trade. And I think I was very specific when I talked about precious metals trades, that precious metals trades are not about certainty, but about risk reward. Alex, let's move on to a subject I've heard quite a few smart people start talking about. And the the thesis goes something like this. It says, look, and these are people who agree with you, by the way, that they don't think we're headed back towards much higher interest rates. And I know that you're long-term bullish bonds, so you expect lower interest rates. What people are saying is, look, there really is a very strong secular argument that we stay at very low interest rates for perhaps a very long time to come. And then the conclusion they draw is that means that bonds, particularly treasury bonds, really don't serve the purpose that they used to serve in a 60-40 portfolio because suddenly the, the return that you get from the actual yield is negligible. And I suppose there's a speculative aspect if you really think that we're going to move substantially lower in, in yields from here. But, you know, we're starting from a pretty low number, so you can't get too excited about that. So. Do bonds still have the role that they've always had in the financial system? Or is this argument that maybe we need to find a replacement for bonds uh, in the portfolio because it doesn't really do what it used to do back in the day when we had, you know, 6 7% treasury yields? That was the risk-free rate. These days, you know, you're, you're looking at a negative real yield on, on treasuries. First, I would like to say that I am more thinking not in terms of 640 portfolio, but in terms of risk parity because I'm a hedge fund person. I'm on one of the original users of and inventors of risk parity. So for me, that is the way of thinking. Does bond overlay help your stock portfolio? I'm not thinking of displacing any of your stocks by bonds. I'm thinking of bond futures as being an overlay, which actually allows you to own more risk assets because they provide some cushion for you. That's how I was thinking about this over the last past 20 years. I was indeed concerned about risk parity as a concept again a year and a half ago, but because I felt yeah, the yields has gone to zero. There is a lot of fluff on the stock market. So a minor rise in, you could have raising yields and still selling off stock market. 
without Fed getting concerned of a stock market sell-off and reversing their policy. I think to an extent, we did take some of that fluff from risk parity because it ran way too far in 2020 with yields going almost to zero and stock market rallying and rallying through 2021. I think risk parity is back and bonds are back because the yields are back and there is a substantive profit to be made when you look at 2% yields. That's at that point, somewhere between 2 or 3%, the bonds become basically symmetric instruments. Uh, once you go to 30-year bonds, they can rally 60% in price going from more than 60% in price, going from 2% yield to zero yield. And they could run, rally probably 100% in price going to negative 1% yield as they've done in some European countries. So if something can rally 100% in price, it can only lose that original value if rates go to infinity and complete default. So they're becoming back to being a symmetric instrument and having some good upside potential. I do think that bonds are more for capital appreciation than for yield these days. However, I feel that uh, this situation right now, that we took a little bit of fluff of stock market and we put some yield potential back. It allows for various trades, not just risk parity trades, but other trades that I like, the trades which are kind of imply, well, the market is projecting rates to go up. What else is going to happen when rates go up? Is the market actually, count what is going to happen to certain currency crosses? What is going to happen to certain structured trades if rates go up? What if market is not pricing those? Then you could be long bonds or betting on rates to be lower, but at the same time, bet on some trades that have to that benefit from higher rates. And it might be a little complex and not always available to individual investors, but I think there are those opportunities opening up now that actually rates, higher rates are on the table. So paradoxically, Fed being hawkish brings the bond bets back on the table. It also actually brings back the bond bull market on the table because as I always talked about, the negative predictive power of interest rate futures the higher the interest rates rates are predicted to be, the lower they'll end up being. So the mo whenever the market prices, oh, there will be a lot of hikes, that actually means that there will be less hikes. And conversely, when the market predicted like in 2020, 2021, that rates are zero forever, that was in some sense predicting actually high interest rates, just as now the hikes are predicting the eases in, in a sense. So I feel like there is game now there to play. The games are back. Having said that, I feel that stock market have run up going back to 60-40 or disparity. I think the stock market has run up so much that the economy could stay strong, strong based on like the improvement of situations of the low income people for a while yet, even if stock market goes down and people who hold assets are hurting a little bit. So there's another, pro what I'm trying to say, sorry, I'm maybe not very articulate about this. What I feel like might be another 10, 15% of slack in stock market that stock market can keep going down, but that the Fed wouldn't blink. There is that a little bit of cushion there, but less than before, because on one side, stock market corrected, on another side, Fed tightened, at least verbally. But you do think that we're only about 10 or 15 percent of downside before the so-called Fed put kicks in and the, the Fed basically changes their tune in order to arrest a falling stock market? What I think is that the Fed put might be not immediately. The Fed might not change their tune immediately. But I think the economic numbers will start changing their tune and eventually the Fed will take a cue from them. I think Fed will change their tune. as They, they need now an excuse to change the tune. Stock market is very strong at affecting people's mood. It creates zeitgeist. Like on the days when stock market is down, psychologically, it's much easier to believe that we're at the end of economic cycle, that things are rolling over. While it might be like a big down day and stock market is 2%, it really changes nothing. But I think we're all familiar with how differently we think on those days when stock market is down 2% than on the days when it's grinding up. So if we have a downgrade in stock market is creating a mood in the investor world, but as well as for the Fed, which will allow them to seize on the opportunity provided by economic numbers to change to more dovish stand. But I think they would still need to have some validation other than just stock market. I think in the end, they do want to see like maybe more moderate inflation or, or weaker employment numbers. It's just the trigger will get much lighter in the environment of stock market sell-off. 
Alex, as you know from your previous appearances on Macro Voices, normally when I get an author on, I leave a minute or two at the end of the interview to let them plug their book. In the case of your new book, it's just too interesting for that. We're going to give it more time. So I'd like to start by reading the first couple of paragraphs from the introduction of your book. In March of 2020, a few days after Shelter in Place was ordered in the Bay Area, my wife woke up in the middle of the night when she heard me collapse on the bathroom floor. I didn't quite pass out, but I was experiencing shortness of breath, palpitations, chills, and severe sweating. I was certain I did not have COVID. It was stress. The path that led us to that point in my health and personal life is inseparable from my journey in financial markets. Have you ever wondered what is going on in the command center of a sophisticated hedge fund? Have you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall of a CIO's office when the markets are melting down. I'm going to end there, uh, but basically the rest of the book is the blow-by-blow story of your experience, Alex, basically trading that market through the collapse and then recovery of 2020. Uh, We obviously can't cover the whole book in an interview, but I'm going to give you more than the two minutes. Let's shoot for less than 10 minutes. Give us the the quick thumbnail uh, abbreviated version of the book. You're on the floor in the bathroom. What happens next? And and get us from there to, uh, you know, the of the pandemic well i was trying to capture in this book not just the sequence of trades but also the psychological journey as a trader like what it is like to manage money when your personal life is getting affected as well a lot of uh, times macro traders like myself deal deal with various disasters around the world there is a war somewhere there is a famine there is a shortage of food there is a shortage of energy there are some tensions all of those things factor in into our analysis, but it's usually remote while you're sitting in the comfort of your office. The first time it was shaken really in my personal life was on September 11th when I was in New York and I had to trade in the days. I had to experience September 11th. Uh, not, I was not directly like downtown. I was midtown, but still I had like people I knew die. I had my personal life deeply affected by that. And then I had to trade the subsequent days. And then, and then, of course, COVID pandemic was even more impactful that way because you yourself personally are going into shutdown. You're worried about your personal health. And at the same time, you have this full uh, responsibility to your clients to keep running the portfolio because that's what they hired you for. They hired you. I'm a macro manager. They didn't hire me to uh, manage money only when times are good. They actually hired me to manage money when there's a crisis. This is where I'm supposed to outperform. That's what I'm there for. It's like being a Marine when the war starts. I have to go in. That's my, I don't want the war to start, but when it happens, that's my job. So I had to go in, but at the same time, I was personally affected and there was a lot of layers of stress and I wanted to talk about navigating them. What I realized, some of the books about trading are written by essentially journalists who often do a really excellent job interviewing a variety of traders. Some of those books are very good, like books by Michael Lewis or Steve Drobny or Gregory Zuckerman or Jack Schwager, and they present lots of interesting perspectives. But those are secondary accounts of people interviewing traders. Now, there are books written by traders. Probably Alchemy of Finance would stand out as one of the most famous ones, but there are many others. And in those books, that, and even my book, which I think is a good book, my first book, The Next Perfect Trade, it presents my perspective, my views, my reminiscences, but they're all colored by my biases. What I tried here is to give an unbiased perspective on how can I do it by actually giving the exact transcript. It's not how I remember things, but how things exactly happen. Of course, I have a comment that I explain what I was thinking at the moment, what was going on through my head, why am I doing this or that. But you could see in this book all the cursing, all the screw-ups, all the fumbling, all the kind of little victory celebrations and um, disappointments that happened to a trader over this intense period. I feel this book is very different in that way because for an aspiring trader, it's the only way to be like a medical student going into the operating room as opposed to reading about it. Even if you were working as an intern on a trading floor, you might still have not been privy to what's going on in the command control and the command center. 
you might have a get a sense of how people interact and what is uh, what is the culture but you will not get to what a step by step is the process so i feel like if you are thinking of getting into trading this book should be a must because it even if you're not going to trade the products i trade even if you're not going to understand all the technical jargon of specific contracts but this will give you an idea at least one story of what it's like to be in the middle of it. And you have to be prepared to be there yourself if you want to be in financial markets. Alex, give us some of the blow-by-blow. Blow. Obviously, you wrote a whole book about this. We've only got about five minutes left. But give us the quick overview. There you are. It's March of 2020. You know, How do you approach this? You know that these assets are all going up eventually, but you're not sure how far down they're going to go first. And especially if you're trading with leverage, you've got to be really careful. You're, you're a hedge fund manager, not a private investor, so you care a whole lot about what that tear sheet looks like. Anything bigger than 5% down in one month, even when there is a crisis going on, raises eyebrows so you know how do you deal with this when it would be tempting probably to take a lot of risk and just say i'll write it out but you got to think about your your returns how do you take this on what was it like how what was your experience like well you pointed out a very important issue navigating the leverage in march 2020 was a very difficult task and i break them because of that kind of issue and the difficulty of navigating it i broke the month into four parts and the first week I call it a victory parade. Because what ha happened is I was well positioned for the crisis and I discussed in detail why I had positions that already working for me in 2019 and they continued to work and I started the year well. In the beginning of March, it was not yet happening to us. There was a pandemic, but it was not still felt so close and personal. And it was just kind of beginning there. And um, the portfolio was making a lot of money because of our um, leveraged bets on lower interest rates because of the options we bought and some of them were essentially free options some of them were very cheap options on rates going lower and uh, as fed started emergency rate cuts we were really raking in cash and then and at that time i started to buy assets i started to already say like oh stock market is going down where what are my picks what do i want to own i started to take profits on my interest rate bets and buy assets and then my second week i called the loss of innocence that's a chapter in my book called The Loss of Innocence. What it means is that that's a time when we realized, well, things are just, it's not just a little plunge in stock markets. This is a much deeper problem, and it actually affects us personally. I'm going to be personally affected. I'm going to personally probably going to be locked down and worry about my personal health and health of people around me. And this is serious, and things are not necessarily going to go the way you expect. Dollar was weakening till March 9th, and dollar started to strengthen because the liquidity started to get in real shortage. And this is why I had to start thinking about this. This idea, pandemic will pass, liquidity will stay. But how soon the Fed would provide liquidity was not clear. And this is where things started to get a little shaky. And the third week, I called it dark days. That's when the stock market hit its bottom, when its liquidity got the worst. And the most, the sense that I really tried to convey in the book and the sense I remember from those days is a sense of dread, a deep existential dread. Not that the world will end and everyone will die from COVID. I'm talking about this in portfolio sense. What I was worried about that all liquidity, all margins, all uh, leverage will run out, that I will, that my balance sheet will be taken away and I won't be able to do anything. I had that fear. And that as I accumulated trades which were already betting on recovery, they were continuing to go down. And my portfolio flipped from going really strongly in the beginning of March to actually losing money in March. I was still up money on the year, but paradoxically, I was beginning to feel margin pressure and cash shortages everywhere because the margin requirements were going up, the liquidity was getting tied in, and I had to really start thinking, how do I navigate risk in this environment? And then, of course, I called the last week of March, the age of wonder, which is when things really rebounded so sharply with the liquidity, when the Fed liquidity at last came through and we started to make money again. And I, I think when you, if you read this book, you'll see this kind of blow by blow thought process of being scared, managing and trying to stay rational, trying to see what is certain and what is uncertain, what things we really don't know about and let's let them go. And what things have to eventually recover and will focus risk there? And how do we keep risk at the stage at the level that we don't blow up? How sometimes we have to 
reverse the trades we just did and give up on them because there was just no certainty and no risk space to do those. That is all reality of it, realities of traders' existence. Well, Alex, I want to compliment you because I think you're on exactly the right track telling the story this way. Because I, I know from my own experience, I was absolutely certain when I started very aggressively selling crude oil futures, and I, I sold as many as I dared to, and when I just didn't dare sell any more, I started buying puts on crude oil futures, so I had a slightly more risk-limited way to get even more short. And I began all of that aggressive selling on January 28th of 2020, and for the entire month of February, I was just sitting thinking, oh my gosh, nobody else sees this. I must be the dummy in this story, because the market for the whole month of February did nothing but melt up. Crude oil futures just kept going up as CNBC told the whole world that it's just the flu and there's nothing to worry about. And I seriously considered exiting all my positions, even though I was so sure that I was right. I almost bailed out just because it felt like, wait a minute, you know, I, I can't possibly be the only guy in the world who's figured this out. Nobody else seems to see it. The market's not doing it. I must be wrong. Well, needless to say, I wasn't wrong, but I almost got scared out of it. Was there ever a moment like that for you where you you had it right, but the market wasn't doing what you expected and that stress of, you know, you're, you're passed out on the bathroom floor and you're worried about your own health and friends of yours are dying? I mean, it was a very stressful time for all of us. I got COVID on March 1st myself. I, I still had all of these big open positions and I'm thinking the market's not doing what it's supposed to be doing and I've got this thing myself. Uh, do you have any experiences like that? Honestly, I was a little lucky from that perspective. And luck, it's not really luck. It's more like about my long-term discipline for crisis preparedness. I make an analogy of this book with poker play. If you start the game winning, it's much easier to make decisions, good decisions afterwards. Like that's why many poker players do the opposite of what they should be doing. When they lose money, they keep playing, trying, trying to make the money back. And when they're winning money, they kind of quit and take the winnings. I've learned long ago to do the opposite. When I'm winning in a poker session, I keep playing and playing. When I'm losing, I just cut it very quickly. Back in the days when I used to play poker. So when you start with a win, it's much easier to think clearly. So I think I was not super concerned about being wrong in March 2020, but I was petrified of just losing the capital and losing liquidity. That worried me much more than being wrong, to be honest, at that moment. I was worried about mechanical failure of my fund much more than the failure of my market views. And I think that has been generally my theme in the past. When I went and drawdown in 2018, I had a drawdown and I talked to some of my investors and I, and my investors were like, how certain you are of my themes? And I said, and I told them, I'm fairly certain of my themes. And if I do fail in my current intention, probably 80% chance that I will fail it because I didn't manage risk well and 20% because I was wrong about my views. So I think I was still that way in 2020. I was much more worried about not managing my capital well and my risk well and my liquidity well than I was worried about being wrong about the market. I really didn't, I was not too concerned about, for example, the idea that stock market would eventually go up and the assets would eventually go up. That seemed to be a fairly certain likelihood. Well, Alex, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Listeners, the book is called The Trades of March 2020, A Shield Against Uncertainty. It's available now in both Kindle and paperback on Amazon and through other booksellers. And of course, it is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you're rethinking your portfolio like most investors right now, it's time to pay attention to one asset class Americans are overlooking. The Wall Street Journal even called it one of the hottest markets. I'm talking about blue chip art. That's right, contemporary artwork has taken the financial world by storm. It outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 through 2020. And some hedge fund managers have allocated over 20% of their portfolios to art. Now you can too with Masterworks. They're the investment platform that recently sold a painting for a staggering $2.9 million, giving investors a net return of 31%. So you no longer have to be a billionaire to invest like one. 
Get priority access to their latest offerings at masterworks.art slash macrovoices. That's masterworks.art slash macrovoices. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Alex on the show. Uh, it's always great to get an update, and uh, uh, I definitely am going to pick up his book and uh, have a read on it. What did you take away from the interview? Patrick, Alex is one of my favorite guys that we talked to, and you know what I found most interesting was the lack of hesitation or pause when I asked him about where he thinks this market is headed. He is still bullish bonds. He's told me he's even more bullish bonds than he was last time we spoke. The fact that we're backed up over this historic number, I should point out, we, we didn't know that. We taped this on Tuesday. We were at one spot 98, not 201 or whatever it is today. But I, I'm pretty sure that it would not change Alex's view. He thinks that uh, this is the opportunity to buy bonds, not to panic and sell them. It'll be very interesting to see how this proves out. I want to move on now, though, to our post-game chart book. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click the red button above Alex's picture that says, Looking for the Downloads. The slide deck is titled, What's Next for the Markets? Patrick, what's next for the Markets? All right. Well, in the first uh, four charts, uh, page two to page five, I have the equity markets of S&P, NASDAQ, Russell, and then uh, a breadth indicator. And uh, what what I wanted to generally kind of approach is the question is that, was this already a market bottom and just uh, the process now of the market rallying? Or is there another leg to this market correction ahead of us? And what we always need to start with and highlight is the fact that Markets always are volatile in both directions during corrections. Some of the biggest market rallies on a percentage basis almost always happen in a bear market. I'm not necessarily calling this a bear market, but it's simply to highlight the fact that just because the stock market had such a ripping rally off of the January low is not something that should be overanalyzed as bullish until we see that the market has legitimately shifted into a bull trend mode. So far, the entire rally on the S&P 500 has been nothing but a 61.8 retracement, which is a typical uh, reactionary move off of a primary trend. And now while I don't want to say that the bulls uh, are done, there's a lot of bullish work that the bulls have to do right here, right now, and break this market higher to show that there's legitimate follow through and, and more meat on the bone on this trend. If we see that uh, these markets continue to just roll over off of this level, and the longer we spend below 4,500 or 4,400 on the S&P, uh, uh, we may have another full leg of a correction ahead of us, one that could uh, see us testing the 4,000 level if things got really out of hand. Well, I guess it could get even worse than that if it got out of hand, but a reasonable target for another down leg would be in that kind of 4,200 to 4,000 level. And uh, what, one of the things that supports that in my mind, when we go to the NASDAQ chart on page three, is that the NASDAQ simply has not been able to muster up any legitimate strength. The, the rally has been pretty pathetic on a relative basis and rotation out of the general NASDAQ and unprofitable tech continues. And the, the NASDAQ was such an important leadership index during the whole run. The fact that we see such weakness in this is certainly not positive. When we then go look at uh, the middle America small caps, the Russell 2000 index, again, the, it was just murdered over over the last two months, uh, three months, and the rally has not even approached the big consolidation trade ranges that were established in 2021 between the kind of 21 to 2200 level. And so all these indices continue to be very weak. But on page five, we have that market breadth. And the market breadth, this is just looking at the percentage of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that are above their 50-day moving averages. Now, we got to a pretty oversold state approach uh, under 25% at the time when the VIX was punching 38 on the upside. And that oversold condition 
was ripe for this bounce that we got in the markets. But in here, uh, we have the VIX trading right back to the 20 handle on the downside at the same time as all the markets had their relief rallies and the breadth of the market remains below 50%. We just see that this is not a broad rally at all. And there has just simply been nothing that has signified that the, this is just all upside from here. Uh, the point I think I want to conclude on this sequence of slides is that we're not out of the woods yet. There is The market is quite vulnerable and uh, and it would not be a shocker for me if we uh, still had another round of selling to come in the month of February. Patrick, let's move on to my own favorite market on page six. You've got crude oil futures. What's going on here? The one thing I just wanted to highlight is obviously since our last episode, we not only had a rip higher in crude oil, which got up to like that 93 level, but we equally had this two, three day oil pullback that uh, got uh, got a, about a $3 pullback going the other way. What's interesting is that we've seen these very short term pullbacks, these pullbacks that last three days, pull back a few dollars. And each time we've seen these, the oil market uses it as a, a almost like a slingshot wind up to make the next bull pivot higher. I think personally what I'm watching for is uh, will we get back to that 92, 93 level on Friday or on Monday? And if we do, does that set up for a punch to 100 on the upside? This is uh, the type of a pullback that would normally start one of those. And so it'll be really interesting to see whether we get a breakout over the next couple trading sessions. What's your take on that? Well, Patrick, the thing I'm watching, and it's very consistent with what you just said. First of all, like you said, we've had just a, a very small pullback. It's the typical wind-up for the next push higher. But even though it's not drawn on this chart, just look at that high in July. Mentally draw a line from there through the high in late October, and you'll see that we're just about touching and actually we perfectly kissed that the highest candle that you see in the last few days just touched that trend line are we going to break above that trend line or do we need to consolidate sideways before this market can move higher and if it's going to be that with everything going on and all the news flow could that consolidation sideways turn into a more substantive move down if you look at something like uh, not so much the the last couple of months but if you look on this chart back to, say, that correction that happened in July. You know, what about something of that size here? Get us back down into the low 80s before powering higher to 100. Uh, this market has gone so far up so quickly, it, it really is overbought. And I think the reason for that, I think, is the geopolitical tension between Ukraine and Russia and what feels to me like the United States trying to fan those flames. I'm not sure why. Um, if that all gets resolved suddenly, if there's some kind of treaty and everybody says, OK, Russia is not going to have a war with Ukraine after all, we, we, we all agree on that. Nobody is beating the war drums anymore. I think there's got to be a very substantial correction lower. On the other hand, if we get an escalation, there's actually some kind of violence that occurs. Somebody starts shooting. Well, then it's it doesn't matter what the trend line says we're going up baby but let's move on now patrick to page seven copper futures boy sure looks like the beginnings of another upside breakout there or i suppose maybe it's not well, you know what? Uh, in January, we had two false starts with copper we're trying to break above the 450 handle and uh, or 450 level. And really, each time it, uh, it faded. But right now, commodities are hot. And this time around, we got a pretty decisive break of that 450 level with some authority. Now, obviously, we're now a stone's throw away from copper's key highs in 2021 as we approach uh, this kind of 475 to 485 level. But uh, overall, copper looks bullish for the first time in a while and uh, one one of the things I'm going to be watching is whether this is marking the beginning of another leg higher after almost a one year consolidation and what we're seeing is, is that uh, that is just transpiring on so many of these other commodities so I wanted to continue to get looking at the grains which is on page 8 9 and 10 I have the charts of, of uh, wheat corn and soybean and uh, while corn has uh, had a huge run on the upside in 2021 it's been rather quiet at the start of the year but that has not been the case when you go to the corn futures or soybean on page nine corn has just been working higher for the last three months just um, up almost it seems like every single day and we seem to have almost an acceleration to the upside here on that but 
while corn is, is hot, what has been really ripping has been the soybean. While it was in the gutter for almost all of 2021, in, in fact, in an almost outright downtrend, we have now seen almost a parabolic, uh, the start of a parabolic rise in the beans, heading back to levels where price levels where it traded in 2021 this quickly. It'll be really interesting to see whether the grains continue to be pressing this speed higher. You know, one of the things, Eric, that we were talking about, just whether, you know, inflation can peak here in February. But I kind of asked the question in my mind is when when you've got this kind of uh, momentum in, in commodities, it's a huge input variable into determining those inflation numbers. How, how does inflation peak when, when we have such broad commodity rallying right across the board? Well, I think the way inflation peaks, at least according to the people who think it's about to peak, is we resolve the cost of fuel, which is a big component of the cost of producing agriculture. And we don't really have secular inflation after all. And it turns out that a lot of what we see in these upside price pressures really was about the pandemic and constrained growing conditions and so forth. And once we start to return to normal, everything's going to get better. Um, I don't think that's the way it's going to go, but it'll be interesting to find out. I can't help but notice here, you know, boy, this looks like it could be the beginning of a cup and handle type of formation. You know, the cup is forming, no sign of the handle yet, but looks like it's heading in that direction. For sure. The final two that I wanted to touch on, though, Eric, was uh, just looking at ones that we typically don't highlight. But uh, I wanted to look at uh, the big breakout in coca futures, which uh, have uh, just been ripping in the last week on the upside and uh, broke to, to a fresh high. And uh, the coffee futures, which have uh, spent all of 2021 ripping. I mean, we had a doubling of coffee futures in 2021. And uh, just when you think that... Uh, it's gone far enough and is due for a correction. Here we break to a fresh new 52-week high and just looks like it wants to go to the next level. The American breakfaster is going to be pissed. <laughs> anyway, but uh, it's, just, uh, it's just commodity after commodity. You're seeing these trends just, uh, just ripping. It'll be really interesting to see how much momentum uh, these can keep. Well, you know, coffee is an interesting one because it is a drug that lots and lots of people are addicted to, and most of them can afford a doubling of the, the price, even though they would be unhappy about it. It's not like they're going to stop drinking coffee if the price goes up. So in terms of the ability of the market to correct itself because that increasing uh, price on the supply curve is supposed to clobber the demand curve, uh, guess what? Everybody who's caffeine addicted still is. On that note, Patrick, for people who are still addicted to your chart decks, which they enjoy every week here on Macro Voices, they can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of your service, Big Picture Trading. Information is on pages 13 and 14, or you can just go to bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks, the billion-dollar alternative investment platform that lets you invest in art by legends like Warhol and Picasso for a fraction of the cost. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. In this week's uh, research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book that we just discussed in the post game. There's also a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at re- Research Roundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelled with a K, and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. 
Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.